Thank you. So I want to combine actually many of the areas that I have combined in myself. I started off as a, an engineer. I then became a psychologist and then helped found this cognitive science field. And then I migrated to design. And what I really care about is the way that technology interacts with people in society. And that's a very important topic with, rel with relevance to persuasion. So I want to actually talk about what is happening today, most of which you know, but I'm going to remind you. And I want to talk a little bit about some design theory, which actually comes from cognitive science, which uh, I'll use to talk about the impact of persuasion and perhaps a possible resistance. So let me start by examining something very different from what we've talked about, namely all the forces that are allied against us, asking us to do things against our will in two different meanings of the word will. So will is things that we don't wish to do, things that um, <clears throat> we've decided we don't wish to do and then we end up doing them or against our will, as in free will, where we are persuaded, perhaps, to buy something that we didn't otherwise think that we needed or wanted. And both of these are different. We act against our will, our conscious will, when we eat that luscious dessert that's in front of us that we know violates our diet. And in order to stop eating this, we actually have to have in consciousness the prohibition to act. And years ago, I wrote a paper about this with Tim Shallis, a neuroscientist, and we actually decided that <clears throat> if we put people in front of a luscious cake and we said, don't eat it, um, they wouldn't. But if we walked behind them and said, boo, they would find themselves eating the cake. That is, once the conscious mind has distracted from the act of forcibly keeping you from doing what your subconscious wants to do, your subconscious takes over. So there are two really, two kinds of minds, the subconscious, which is automatic, and the conscious, which is slow and deliberate and does not have direct control over what we do, only can exert biases. That's a simplification of what really goes on in the brain, but it's a useful simplification. We also act against our will when we purchase a popular piece of music, not necessarily because we like it, but because we want others to see it in our playlist. Or we buy a new automobile because, oh, the old one is old and people will think badly of us, or even the way we dress. And both of these last two examples are engineered. And they're engineered deliberately by those who market music and those who um, design the taste. For example, potato chips. <coughs> Can you eat one potato chip, or do you start eating the potato chips and finish the bag? Well, it's not accidental. Uh, the potato chips have been designed to induce this craving for more and more and more, designed through the chemicals that are put into them that will affect the hormonal balance and designed by the salt. And of course, we're continually being assaulted by modern technology, by tweets, by blogs, by advertisements. Um, we're left with little time for thought, little time for reflection. Uh, yeah, we're given opportunities to connect to our long lost friends and make new ones who seem to share our interests. And all these services are free. We don't pay for them. Isn't it really neat that we can examine the stuff on the internet? We can tweet, we can go to Facebook, we can go to Netflix, well, and that, pay, that we have to charge for. Uh, but on the whole, most of this stuff is free. Now, in the 20th century, that was a long time ago, we got used to having things for free, like radio and television, or things that were subsidized, like newspapers, so we didn't have to pay the full cost. And we thought that was not a bad trade-off, but we knew what the trade-off was, it was advertising. Uh, by allowing ourselves to be subjected to ads, we got these things for free. And it wasn't too bad because the advertisement was very explicit. We knew when it started, we knew when it stopped, and we could ignore it, go out and get a drink when the ad comes on on television, or in the newspaper, read it or not, our, we could choose where to move our eyes. 
Well, <clears throat> that trade-off was simple, but <clears throat> it, also, it also changed an outlook. We were no longer people. We were consumers. And the job of a consumer is to consume. And so the advertisements were there to help us consume, because that's how companies kept in business, by causing us to consume. And <coughs> this all started a long time ago. Probably the first major indication is the automobiles. In roughly the 1950s, the automobiles deliberately designed themselves so that you would have to buy a new one every two or three years. Not only would they fall apart, but there was an annual fashion change, if you will. So the style of the automobile would change. There'd be new features every single year, and every four or five years, there'd be a major change in the automobile, so that it was very visible to other people when you had an old automobile that was not in fashion. And the automobiles pioneered this, that you should always have a new thing. And if you didn't have a new thing, you were shamed. And the advertisements helped increase the shame. And the advertisements were sometimes subtle, because they were sometimes the contents of the media that we were watching, whether it was, or listening to, radio, newspapers, magazines, and then later on, television. We are consumers. Now, <clears throat> the trade-off, again, with the advertisements is, um, we gave them permission to send us the advertisements because we thought we could also control whether we watched them or not. And in the industry jargon, we were not even called consumers, we were called eyeballs. Because what mattered was attention. So, in other words, what they were buying was our attention. Or what the advertisements were paying for was our attention, our eyeballs. So again, we are consumers and our job is to consume. In 1958, <coughs> Packard wrote a very influential book at the time, it was called Hidden Persuaders, in which he realized that the marketing industry and the advertising industry were doing numerous studies trying to understand how to convince us without our being aware that we were being convinced. And a huge amount of good applied psychology was being done in the advertising journals. Now let's move to today. There's a new revolution, the technology revolution. <clears throat> and we go through certain cusps. And we had one a number of years ago when the personal computer developed and then the personal computer actually became usable. And then um, the power of computation increased, the internet developed, the browser developed, and then the, the cellular telephone or the mobile came into being and became everywhere pervasive. Today we're on a different cusp. And it's brought about because all of these technologies have matured, and now suddenly the stuff that's been in the research laboratories for the last 20 years are finally affordable and possible. So we have multi-touch screens, which was in the laboratories 20 years ago. And we have, what else? Pervasive communication, huge amounts of memory storage, cloud storage, which allows un incredible amount of computation. The world's supercomputers now are available to any one of you. If you want a supercomputer, you simply go to Amazon. <clears throat> because Amazon sells books, right? And they sell things. And to do that, they need huge amount of computers behind to figure out what's being bought, what's being sold, what's in inventory, and to help you buy by saying, oh, I see where you looked at this. Well, people who are similar to you have purchased this or looked at these other devices, so why don't you look at those too? Now, that computer power isn't being used all the time. So Amazon will sell it to you. And so today in Silicon Valley, most startups don't bother to buy computers. They borrow their time from Amazon. They borrow their memory from Amazon because that way it's very flexible. And if you need to put together one million processors, you can do it. You can do it. It's processors for rent, so you can do incredible things. So the revolution is a lot of things. It's computation, communication, displays, powerful sensors, um, the internet, and this concept called apps. 
and then monstrous computu computation and storage and what we call the cloud, which we did done in some, some location, some place in the world or distributed across the world, and we don't have to worry our minds about it. It's taken care of for us. Now let me back up to a bit of theory. <clears throat> it's really applied theory. So in the 1980s, I introduced a concept from perception that's called affordance. And I introduced that to design and said affordance allows, tells you sort of what a technology affords or what something affords. This table affords support. These notes afford not just reading but flexibility so I can change my speech as I even give it. Um, well, the new technologies, the technological affordances are connecting, observing, spying, correlating, data mining. And so the story has changed rather dramatically. So let me talk about an artificial company. So suppose we had a company, and I'll call it old Bugle. Now, now Bugle makes many things available to the people who use it for free. Um, there's search, and specialized search for authors, airline flights, hotels, comparison shopping, restaurants. <clears throat> and Google also makes available cloud-based documents, spreadsheets, drawing packages, 2D, 3D, and blocking tools, and websites, and amateur and professional videos. And even, even Google even makes an operating system for cell phones, which they give away free to the manufacturers. So why does Bugle do this? I mean, how do they survive? Where do they get their money? Um, what's their product? So what is Bugle's product? And who are their customers? <clears throat> Most people think it's search. Well, it isn't search. It's you. You are the product. Your data, your interests, your intentions. In the past, advertisers only knew your demographics and what you might be reading or watching or listening to. Now they know your age, your wealth, where you live, who you go out with, what you're thinking about, what you're looking at, what you're buying. And when you read something, they even know what page you're reading at the moment, if you're using an e-book. And if you're watching a video that's being streamed to you, they know what you're watching. And if you're watching TV through a video data recorder, they know when you watch it, they know which ads you skip or which, when you rewind and watch an advertisement again. They know a tremendous amount about you. On top of that, they loved walled gardens. They want to make their place so attractive that when you go, you never, ever leave. And we have walled gardens all over. Google's a world walled garden, so is Amazon. Apple would love their iTunes to be a walled garden. Um, but so are other sites. Uh, in the, in <coughs> and in uh, Europe, we have your own sites. Uh, Market Plus would be a site, for example. Now, to be fair, Bugle or Google, whether real or imagined, doesn't sell your details with your name on it. But they collect all of this, and that's what they sell to the adv advertisers. They know everything. <coughs> Now, this is coming even more places, so that, look at the internet. Where is the internet? Well, it's on your phone, it's on your computers, it's in your car, it's in your navigation system, it's on your TV. LG just released a TV set that has the internet built in, and they released it with advertisements. So they have a company that provides advertisements on your TV set whenever you turn it on. Um, so you have your, in your entertainment center, your TV sets connected to the internet, as is your Blu-ray DVD player, as is your video data recorder, as is whatever service you use for streaming video, if you want. And, of course, your computers and your cell phones, and pretty soon your toilet and your refrigerator and your microwave oven. And for that matter, uh, there is a new thermostat on the market that is connected to the internet so it knows what the weather forecast is. I can go on and on in this, but I won't. Let me just end up. There's another concept. It's called, it's kind of a theory of mind. Um, <coughs> the the um, philosopher, Dennett, thank you, Daniel Dennett, uh, argued once about three different kinds of stances we can take with regard to things. He called one the physical stance, 
one the designer stance and the other one the intentional stance. And what he meant was, if I see a chair or an object, I look at it physically and try to figure out how to use it. Or I try to figure out why it was designed this way. Let me look at that designer stance. If we start to understand why the advertisements are here, that's knowledge. If every time we see something, see something advertising, and we say to ourselves, why was it there? What did they have in mind? That's knowledge. That knowledge is the beginning of moral resistance. Knowledge is partially it. Nudge? Nudge is a direction, but nudge is too weak. It's too subtle. What we really need is something like a powerful reset. What we really do is to change the value system that we have. That old is good, not bad to be replaced. Old is good, green is good, sustainable is good, fair is good. Now, that plus our knowledge, plus our understanding of the role that the affordances and the designers play is a big beginning. Now, I just have to warn you, though, the way the world works. Just like <coughs> spammers spam, we build in anti-spam devices. Spammers are clever. They get around the anti-spam devices. They pr produce more. Terrorists terrorize. We figure out ways against them. They figure out clever ways around it. Uh, people who try to break into our security are especially good. They're computer science professionals. They break into the system. We fix that break. They find a new one. The same will happen with a knowledge game. And so it's time to reset, but we'll have to be resetting for the rest of eternity. Thank you. Thanks, Don.